seems like with osteoporosis, there's so much conflicting information out there. And there's so many, what I would say are myths. So I'm going to invite you guys, the audience, to do a little pop quiz with us. So you can answer it in your mind or you can type in your comment. It's just going to be a true or false. And I'm going to just do a couple of questions right now. Maybe we'll uh, pop up with some other ones later. So the first one is true or false, right? Type your comments. Is osteoporosis painful? So you guys just type in true or false and let me know what you think. And then we'll have the doctors kind of talk about that in a little while. So did you, well, let's just talk about it. Is osteoporosis painful? That's something that people are kind of confused about. Dr. Fontaine, what do you say? Well, that's a tricky one, you know, because um, most of it is uh, asymptomatic. That means we don't feel that we have osteoporosis. However, when uh, osteoporosis become pretty advanced, especially with women in the back, they're going to have some uh, pain uh, in the back. So you got to be careful in, in this question. But, you know, most of the time, this is totally uh, asymptomatic. We don't know until there's a fall and then there's an accident where you can have a hip fracture of any other broken bone. But a tendency is to have hip fracture or, um, you know, into, uh, let's see, the wrist. Uh, it are uh, probably some of the biggest area where you can have a fracture. Anything else, Jeff, you think? Yeah, I think that's part of the tricky part about this disease is that uh, it's going, you're developing osteoporosis and you don't know it. There's no signs like, oh, my hip is hurting and so I might have an osteoporotic fracture in the next five years. It's not based on pain. You don't have pain. And, and while there have been, I think there was some misinformation that might have been related to a drug that was coming out saying, oh, it's, it could be painful and, and maybe striking some fear in the hearts of people. Um, really, osteoporosis is not a, a painful thing. Strangely enough, you could even have some uh, osteoporotic fractures like a spot, like a vertebral uh, or a back fracture that's asymptomatic and, and, and a woman doesn't, typically a woman doesn't know about it until say you're getting a chest x-ray to make sure they don't have a pneumonia and you happen to say, hey, did, did you fall? Because, you know, two or three of your um, vertebral bones have been fractured. So even some of the fractures can be painless. Um, but if you have a hip fracture, which is the main concern, oh, that's, that's very noticeable and you're going to know that it's there. Hmm. That's a big deal because so often we think that if we have pain, that that's the only time that we have to go to a doctor. And right. a lot of things are asymptomatic for a while before they present as something more serious. So sometimes it is important to be uh, aware of these things. You know, you don't feel your, your liver, you know, you don't feel these organs inside of you until maybe it's more advanced. So that's good to know. So let's try another question. Is osteoporosis due to a calcium deficiency? True or false, guys? What do you think? Hmm. Okay, we'll start with Dr. Pierce on this one. Okay, so I think that um, when you, if you were to poll people on the street and say, hey, what's the main cause of osteoporosis, of this thinning of the bones, of this weak, sort of fragile bones that you typically see in older age? Most people would say, oh, it's because we're not getting enough calcium. Um, and while calcium is an important element in the formation of the bones, it's a, a major component of the bones, and it's very important to have calcium, it's not an all or nothing. It, you can't um, have tons of calcium and by taking, taking in lots of calcium and do nothing else for your bones and expect that you're gonna have healthy bones. Um, and, and so it's part of the equation, but it's not, uh, it's not even the, the, major, the major part. It's, it's certainly part of the equation. Dr. Fontaine. No, I agree with you, Jeff. And there's so many other factors. So as an example, you mentioned that, Amy, at the very beginning, um, you know, the... Um, women tend to be at risk uh, much more than the men and uh, probably more after the menopause uh, age. And therefore, we all know that after menopause, you know, we're losing an hormone that is extremely important, the estrogen. And therefore, after that, we become uh, excessively more at risk than the men regarding uh, this disease um, that is uh, osteoporosis. So uh, that's another factor that can play 
Uh, and the calcium, we always say again, like Jeff said, you know, you know, take some more calcium, but you know, there's many other things that needs to be done. And you know, I don't know if it's the time to potentially discuss that, but we all know that, you know, first of all, you can increase your bone up to about the age of 30 for any reason. After that, it seems that it's decreasing progressively and even more after menopause. So, you know, the thing that if there was one big, big message that I would like to make sure that all your audience know is prevention. It is so important, prevention and prevention also in the younger population so that when they come to my age, they're going to have a better, you know, bone mass. So it's important to do a little bit more of the weight bearing exercise in order to build some strong uh, muscle. Uh, but also for the older people to be uh, careful um, for the fall risk. Because, you know, we know that at my age, I'm starting to be losing my balance. And the people that I see with fracture of the hip that are older, it's usually by not so much only by the lack of, you know, a, a stronger bone, but the lack of balance. And they fall and have the injury. So um, those are the, uh, you know, kind of important message that we can uh, give uh, potentially in relationship to, you know, as you say, calcium. That's so good to know, because I think a lot of us think if I just take this supplement or this medication, everything will be taken care of and I don't have to worry about it. And as we're going to t talk about today, there is a lot of factors and maybe calcium has a little bit to do with it, but there's so much more that our audience needs to know about osteoporosis and the prevention of it. So let's see if we have another true or false Okay, so type your answer in the comments if you like. Is cow's milk a remedy for osteoporosis? So a lot of people talk about cow's milk because of the calcium content. So Dr. Pierce. Okay. Oh, that's so, the one. Yeah. So if you if you watch the commercials, um, uh, you know everyone would be saying definitely cow's milk. This is what's gonna keep us from getting our weak bones, and this is what's gonna fix it if we do get it. And it's a, uh, it's a, unfortunately, it's not, uh, it's not straightforward like that. Um, it is a, it's a complicated uh, issue uh, when it comes to osteoporosis, but um, it, several scientific studies have shown that um, drinking more and more of cow's milk doesn't prevent uh, osteoporosis and it, it doesn't treat it. And you can, you know, there's a mixture of studies uh, looking at big populations. Uh, over time, um, pictures in time, uh, looking at thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals, and some interesting stuff comes up. And so one, for example, is countries that have the highest dairy consumption are also, also tend to be countries that have some of the highest fracture risks. Um, and, you know, certainly we're saying that this is a, a very complicated process, and there's many things that go into deciding whether or not you're going to have osteoporosis or not. But if it was as straightforward as drinking milk and eating cheese, then um, those countries that ate the most uh, would have the lowest rates of osteoporosis. That's not true. Um, there, there are other studies that look at, uh, oh, well, let's see. Um, if you drank a whole lot of milk when you were young, when you're building your bone mass, which Dr. Fontaine was just talking about, um, then maybe you, you'll have less, uh, fewer fractures when you get older. And, and that's uh, unfortunately also not true. Um, and uh, there was um, a big study out of uh, Sweden, for example, where they looked at this over time and they saw that, you know, kind of the more milk you drink, um, not only the more fractures you had, um, but also um, increased cases of heart attack and stroke and, and death and stuff like that. So it's, it's um, I, I, we're going to talk about how to prevent it and how to deal with it once you have it, um, but it's not going out and... Um, buying a five gallon uh, jug of milk. Well, that's great. And I'm going to also ask Dr. Fontaine to chime in, but I, I'm loving this because probably a lot of the people that are watching this probably guessed right on that one, but mm -hmm. they want to show their family and their friends and loved ones why this is not something that they need to be considering when they want to worry about osteoporosis. So this is still pearls of wisdom that's going to get passed on to other people, even if it may not be on this particular question, the people that may necessarily be watching. So Dr. Fontaine, do you want to add to that? 
Yeah, I think Jeff uh, explained pretty good uh, um, the situation with the milk. Uh, the other thing is we tend to simplify the problem by saying it's only one thing. And we know, like I mentioned earlier, there's multiple factors. Like we didn't even touch vitamin D as an example. If you want to be able to absorb the calcium, you need vitamin D. I'm not going to go deeply now for the, that conversation. We could later. But everything else that you eat, there's so many other things that we may be able to discuss uh, in a plant base that has the calcium that you need. And into the population that tends to drink more milk, they also have the typical American diet, which may not be totally helpful into helping the bone, you know, to uh, the bone mass. So it, it, it's so many, many other factors. We got to be careful of not talking only about one. Like, like the example was what I said earlier, osteoporosis with women after menopause. So there's hormones that are important. So it's all multiple factors that we have to uh, put all together in order to have good bone mass. Very good. Well, so we've established that it's not necessarily painful until it's maybe progressed. And we've established that calcium, even cow's milk, is not necessarily the end all solution. So what are things that people can consider when they're trying to prevent osteoporosis? Let's try that. When they're trying to prevent osteoporosis, what should they be thinking about? So we'll start with Dr. Pierce. Great. I, um, so I think osteoporosis is key here. The old adage of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure is true with so many things in health, uh, and osteoporosis is a really good example of it. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, Elizabeth and I, we, we were trained in the traditional medical model, um, and in med school and residency, the training that we get is, okay, someone, this is how you diagnose osteoporosis, and this is uh, the, the medications that you need to put them on. And that's just, that's just how we're trained in, in um, much of the world's medical system. Um, and so, so much of what we've learned about prevention of osteoporosis and prevention of diabetes and heart disease and cancer has come uh, after uh, medical school. And um, so, uh, focusing on prevention is where it's at, and here are a couple of examples. So, um, I think the main way to think about osteoporosis is not a deficiency in some element um, in your diet or that you don't uh, have, a, you're not taking the right pill or something like that. You should be thinking about osteoporosis uh, when it comes to uh, you use it or you lose it. Uh, and it goes back to um, uh, Julius Wolf. He has a uh, Wolf's Law, which shows basically bones will respond to the stress that are placed upon, uh, upon mm -hmm. them. And so if you think about, you know, if you think about astronauts and we've got a doctor in our team, Nikki Davis, who uh, used to work as an engineer uh, for the space shuttle program before she joined us as a doctor. Um, and so she, uh, I'm sure, has uh, uh, more to say about uh, her experience with astronauts. But, you, you know, you spend time in the space station or you spend time in zero gravity training, et cetera, your bones get weaker because you're not having a force placed on them. OK, so. We're not astronauts, and uh, so therefore we have the benefit of gravity working on us, but we need more than just gravity. So um, that is, comes in the form of weight-bearing exercise, um, so hitting the gym, doing weights, doing bands, going for a hike with a backpack on. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of gardening, so you know, you're know you lifting your buckets of compost and, uh, and soil as you move them around your garden, um, and all of this uh, comes together to help build strong bones and strong muscles. Uh, if you're sick in bed for a month, your muscles get weak and your bones get weak too. It's the same idea. So you want to keep those bones nice and dense um, and, and think about osteoporosis prevention, number one, in uh, keeping your bones strong based off of applying a force to them. Um, and th that includes also going for, um, for jogs, going for runs. Uh, some people, especially as you get into your 70s and 80s, aren't you know, perhaps going for trail uh, trail runs uh, because of some of the difficulty with unstable terrain and stuff like that, but going for a walk and maybe uh, wearing what they call a weighted vest where you start with a pound or two um, and then little by little you uh, work up to six, 12 or more pounds. Um, and that really puts additional force uh, on your skeleton. So that's one thing. Um, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth, you want to add some other things? 
he said that's one thing he, <laughs> he, got, he, he gave a lot of good good information that's amazing i like it so what happened when you have young physician they have all sorts of answer so i i guess the the first thing is what you said amy at the beginning is that osteoporosis is, is a disease um, that is silent that we don't talk much about and we should we should because if you think about population of my age that are part of the i'm kind of at the end of the baby boomer but we're gonna hit the wall pretty soon and have a lot of unfortunate story of, of fracture. And we start to um, kind of put the diagnosis and suggest that we should be some, doing some testing around age 65. So you can just imagine how much bone loss we have um, established at that time. So prevention, like Jeff said, is um, definitely amazing. And the other thing we have to be careful, probably I discuss more the factor that affect people of my age, is to be uh, not only um, you know hitting the gym and doing weights, which is at our age sometimes a little bit more difficult, but thinking about uh, doing some balance exercise and doing some yoga, tai chi, just to learn is also extremely important to prevent fall. So those are um, elements that I would like to add from uh, what uh, um, Jeff had mentioned. That's yeah. very good, and I think going along with preventing preventing falls you have to think about so many americans are on prescription medications and maybe they have some side effects that could make them a little lightheaded or dizzy or maybe they're having you know maybe they're adopting this plant-based lifestyle and they're reducing salt and now they're on medication and maybe they're becoming overly medicated because their blood pressure is coming down i mean there's so many factors and then women oh do we like to wear practical shoes not really so, so <laughs> a lot of us are wearing these heels and we and that you know as we especially i think as we get older and our our balance and equilibrium might be changing i think these are really good things to be thinking about and and i think that uh, with exercise a lot of people think that you have to do the cardio and not really thinking about making the muscle so dr pierce Tell us about muscle and why that's an indication of whether your bones are strong without even sure. having to do a scan. Sure, sure. I want to talk about that. But there's one thing that you said that was such a good point. I want to uh, touch on real quick first with uh, is about um, just falls around the house, maybe secondary to some of the medications you're on. So I forget what it is. It's like the average American adult is on takes something like six different medications uh, per year or something like that. And of course that factors in the people who are on 24 and those that are on zero. And, um, but there, there are a lot of uh, people on meds that can have side effects. And, um, and if you, uh, if you go to the gym or, or otherwise doing home workouts and you're building up strong muscles, but um, you know, your eyesight's poor because you haven't gotten a new prescription in your glasses and you trip on the, computer cord while you're trying to watch be green with amy i mean you're gonna have you're gonna get a hip fracture perhaps right so you need to be able to uh it's a it's a um it's a complete sort of uh approach to where you want to prevent falls from simple hazards such as oh i'm getting hypotensive because of a medication that i'm on because i've switched to a plant-based diet and my blood pressures come down but I, but you know, my doctor's forgotten to take me off of my three blood pressure medicines that I was on when I was eating the standard American diet. So thanks for bringing that up, Amy. Good stuff. Um, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, the, you were asking about um, the relationship to strong muscles and strong bone. I mean, it, it's that um, they they come together, right? It's uh, the forces that you're having to keep your muscles from wasting to avoid what's called sarcopenia um, uh, it are the same forces that are um, being applied to your bones to keep the, um, the osteoblasts, which are the cells in our bones that build up the bone uh, working um, and, you know, make sure that you're also having healthy osteoclasts, which break up, uh, break up the uh, bone that needs to be remodeled. Um, so these forces are helping to guide these uh, cellular elements in the right lines and the right ways. Um, and so uh, it's making the bones more dense, having strong muscles. If you trip, um, you can catch yourself because your quads are strong enough to stop the fall. You know, that's part of it. Um, uh, going along, though, in addition to balance training through Tai Chi, low yoga, stuff like that, that Elizabeth mentioned. Mm -hmm. Right. So Dr. Fontaine, Dr. Pierce talked about these fancy words that sound the same, 
I hate when, when they're either Latin or they sound the same. Or So osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Let's tell our audience what these things are and why they're so important to know about with osteoporosis. So the bone, you know, first of all, osteoporosis, osteo is the bone and porosis is porous. So that means the bone is becoming more porous. That means, you know, breaking bone. And this happened with, uh, you know, the, the bone in itself is not a, 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 a dead element. It's really uh, livable. And because of that, we have different cells. And basically those are the two cells, like you mentioned, that is so, um, you know, have almost the same name. So the osteoblasts are the ones that are working very hard to build new bones, which are the one that works very hard until you're about 30. Like I mentioned earlier, this is how you build um, the bones. But you also have the other cell that needs to be there to clean up a little bit. And those are the ones that we call the osteoclast, so that they tend to remove uh, what's not working anymore, but seems that during a certain period of our uh, life, especially after, let's say, women menopause, there's a tendency of not having as much bone formation, which is the osteoblast, but a little bit more uh, resorption, which we call the osteoclast, and therefore we're losing the strength of our bone and our bone becomes porous, and that's what we call the osteoporosis. Does that make sense? Well, there we have. There you go. Yeah. So, Dr. Pierce, maybe you want to kind of talk about this graphic that we have comparing uh, different kinds of bone density. Sure. I mean, uh, it looks like from this uh, graphic, uh, the uh, big square like bone on uh, what's the left side of my screen um, is one of the vertebral bodies, one of the main parts of our spinal bone. It looks like, uh, you know, it has tiny little holes in it. That's normal. It's, it's got a, it's normal structural work. And as you go further down, it looks like it becomes more and more porous, more and more brittle. And the bottom one looks, it's, it's uh, sort of wedge shaped, a classical finding. When you look at a uh, x-ray, a chest x-ray on side, you can see um, that it's uh, collapsed, uh, you know, sort of like, um, a building where the top floor is collapsed on it a little bit. And um, this is a, an example of a, a, a vertebral body fracture, uh, a back fracture. And, and if you have one or two or three of these in a row, um, this is what leads to the, uh, I think it's the dowager's hump or the widow's hump um, that you uh, uh, can see with uh, some elderly women who have osteoporotic fractures. Mm. Back. Right. Okay. So, so Dr. Fontaine, why do the doctors prescribe these medications that, like one of them is called Fosamax? Well, well how does that work with these osteoblasts and osteo? How does this all work? And why do they say that it's something that people need? Well, I think the first thing is a little bit what um, Jeff had mentioned uh, earlier. You know, um, in, in the medical school that we went, we've learned how to treat and we tend to give medication. So, so pharmaceutical had been, you know, present quite a bit in order to, you know, obviously try to help us with a problem like osteoporosis. So not that I want to name all the different uh, medication. Um, but some are good to help us to build a little bit more muscle. Uh, and some are there to decrease the work of the osteoclast, which, you know, breaks the bone. So we have those bisphosphonate, we have the estrogen, we have a different type of medication. And the, it, it, tell you the truth, even as a physician, it is hard to keep up with all the medication that are coming in the market. They are just there like we know, you know, you give medication in order to hopefully prevent uh, for the osteoporosis to progress and therefore prevent fracture. So we didn't discuss even the diagnosis, but let's say that we know that somebody has osteoporosis. You know, we obviously, uh, the typical physician would have a tendency to offer the medication uh, in order to potentially increase the osteoblast and having a little bit more bone, which is difficult. Um, or decreasing the osteoclast, which will be kind of breaking the bone and hopefully decrease the fracture. Unfortunately, under a, a, an, an exam that we call the DEXA, um, 
It could look like you're gaining bone mass. However, it's difficult to tell if it's so much 100% really working as decreasing substantially the bone fracture. So in itself, we go back to what we said earlier, prevention is probably what's not discussed sufficiently. And we should be very careful about trying to encourage people, not only with the exercise, but the perfect or improving their diet in order to make sure that they have a good consistency of calcium intake of all the different uh, elements that we should eat and the vitamin D, which is most of the time, you know, forget that how important the sun uh, could be in order to help us to get sufficient amount of vitamin D to be able to absorb the calcium to help us with the bone formation. Yeah, that's very important. You know, I live in Florida and I always insist on having my physician test for certain things. And one of the things I insist on is vitamin D because my mother actually had rickets when she was a child. Wow. That's, that's, wow. Yeah. For those of you that aren't familiar with that, that is something that is caused by low vitamin D. So I feel like genetically, maybe I don't absorb vitamin D as well as maybe other people do. And Actually, my husband and I, we get to spend a lot of time together indoors and outdoors. And like I said, I'm in a sunny location and I was very, very low, uh, even by general medical standards. So let's talk about vitamin D. Dr. Pierce, what should we do? Should we get a test to see what our level is? Is sunshine enough? Do we supplement? What, what do we do? Sure. Um, and happy to talk about vitamin. Happy to talk about vitamin D. Very, very important. And if we want to come back to uh, chat about the medications a little bit more, um, I'm happy to do that as well um, later in the talk. But as far as vitamin D goes, yes, it's you know it's uh, it's the sunshine vitamin. It's actually a hormone. We think about it mostly as a vitamin, though, when we're talking about it. And um, it is uh, it is made in our skin uh, conver uh, through a conversion through the sun. It's, it, you know, makes me feel uh, like I'm partly related to a plant, um, how important the, the sun is to us, how we need to get outside and make this very important hormone. And um, it is, it, 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 it's sort of basic function when it comes to bone health is that it uh, increases intestinal absorption of your calcium. Um, and so it, I, I think the best way to get in in general is from a safe exposure, smart exposure to sunshine. You know, I'm, uh, I'm a family doctor and have seen lots of people with uh, sun damage and skin cancer and stuff like that. And so I don't recommend, you know, sitting in a tanning booth all day or um, setting up with uh, mineral oil and the reflective screen uh, on the beach and uh, sitting there for a couple of hours. But getting 15 to 30 minutes worth of sun um, during the non-winter months, months depends on where you are latitude wise and it depends on your skin tone the lighter your skin is actually the less time you need to get the vitamin d um that you need for general health um but uh you know during the winter uh, where a lot of us live in the northern hemisphere um or far south in the southern hemisphere like um south africa chile argentina stuff like that um during our winters uh because of the angle of the sun uh it's uh, pretty impossible to get enough vitamin d um, uh, you know, Dr. Fontaine lives up in the Northeast and, uh, even if she were to go for a long bike ride, uh, in, in the end of December without any clothes on, uh, one that would be risk that would draw all sorts of, all sorts of attention, but it also wouldn't give uh, her the vitamin D that she needs, um, during that long ride. And so supplementing becomes, um, necessary. And so um, the values for how much to supplement, just like the values of how much calcium you should have in your diet are all over the place. Um, and you see, you know, two, four, 800 international units. Um, I think the research that's been compiled through Michael Greger on nutritionfacts.org uh, is excellent. And his uh, recommendation is generally about 2000 international units of uh, colocalciferol typically, which is vitamin D3. Um, and so personally, that's what I do when I'm in the, winter uh, up here in Northern California. Um, I try to remember to take some vitamin D um, uh, and um, you know, I'm not perfect with it as a, as a testament to how most of us are not great at taking pills. 
um, I think something like 40%, there's like 40% adherence to the bisphosphonates and medications like that for osteoporosis. And so I'm um, trying to get it out in the sun, go for a walk outside, you know, get out in the garden, et cetera, do your, do your exercise outside and that'll get you um, a lot of what you need. Yeah, there's so much talk lately about vitamin D that it is a hormone and people think of it as vitamin D as a vitamin because it was just talked about in when early research happened that it was something that was necessary to absorb calcium. But now with all this research, it, it can stabilize mood. It, 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 there's just so many benefits to having a good level. So Dr. Fontaine, should we get tested? And if we do, what should our levels be? What do you think? Yes, I, I have to admit on that, my gosh, when I started measuring uh, vitamin D, that must have been around 10 years ago when I joined the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And at that time, it, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of my uh, fellow physicians that were really questioning and, and still a lot, a lot of, um, you know, physicians uh, don't necessarily believe, but there's so much more literature, like you just mentioned, Amy. So I have a tendency to encourage my people to have vitamin D, especially where I am. I'm, I'm in Vermont. Uh, people are not exposed to too much sun, like uh, uh, Jeff said, and I don't bike in December, Jeff. It's a little <laughs> cold. Mm -hmm. So I do, I do some cross country skiing, but it is true. Our exposure may not be as good. And therefore I do encourage people to have vitamin D uh, evaluation. Uh, and, and again, oh my gosh, for the um, value, it is, uh, there is so much uh, discrepancy and discussion of what should be the best uh, number. Um, so I was trying to believe that, you know, if you have a number and it, and it was pretty large, it's between uh, I can't remember the unit, Jeff, if you remember, let's let me, it's between 20 and 50. Mm -hmm. And now we can nanograms per milliliters. So, so that gives you a pretty wide range, uh, which most people may fall into this range. But in itself, what we're looking for is to uh, gravitate more toward the 50. So you don't want to overdo it. But gravitate around 40, 50 is definitely good. And you will see, Amy, pretty amazingly uh, that there's people that are way below 20 so that we have to help them to replace not only for the bone, but for many other, uh, you know, disease uh, that seems to be uh, totally helped um, by the uh, taking vitamin D or the small, um, you know, safe exposure uh, to the sun like Dr. Peace mentioned. Well, that would make sense because long ago there weren't many clothes and we were outdoors a lot and maybe our bodies are meant to absorb more sun and have a higher level of vitamin D. And that's a really important thing to, to know about. So it's not just the calcium. I mean, that might have a factor, but if you don't have the vitamin D, you're definitely not going to absorb it. So now there may be other vitamins that are involved in healthy bones, right? I mean, it's not just a simple, you know, get your vitamin D levels up and, and make sure you have enough, you know, calcium, but not too much. So Dr. Fontaine, what do you think is another vitamin that we should have to be concerned about? Well, I think on that, I try to be careful. Uh, don't want people that it's, it's more uh, gravitate towards simplicity because mm -hmm. then it becomes so, um, if people don't know what to eat anymore. Uh, and and into, uh, as an example, the plant food base, we want to encourage people to have a nice color, uh, you know, plate. Uh, we include the fruits, the vegetable, green vegetables, very important for, you know, the calcium and other vitamins, basically. Uh, you know, the beans, the nuts, uh, the tofu. Uh, you know, we just want to make sure that they have a, a, a nice and a big variation into what they eat. Uh, and I, I don't try to be measuring everything too specifically because it becomes more of a burden. And, and then they, they're lost. Too much information. You've said that at the beginning. And that is not the way I want to go. I want to make sure that it is simple for them and that I encourage them to eat a nice color for plant food based a diet. Uh, maybe Jeffrey doesn't necessarily. Um, believe in what I'm saying. So if you want to add any element to what I'm saying, I'd be more than happy to listen to your suggestion. Yeah. You know, a little controversy is always good, but unfortunately I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. I mean, I think you can say, well, you know, in addition to calcium and vitamin D, 
um, vitamin K and K2 and boron mm -hmm. and silica and, pota and potassium and manganese and uh, magnesium and, uh, you know, but then, then someone's like, oh my gosh, I don't know if I'm getting enough manganese in my diet. And like, that's not something you should worry about, right? You should worry that you're eating a, um, a whole food plant-based diet where you get this variety of colorful vegetables. This cycle is the same, uh, fruits and vegetables, legumes. You're going to get this mix of, uh, of the protein that you need, the fiber that you need, the vitamins and the minerals. Um, and, uh, all together, it adds up to, um, getting all of these, um, very small amounts of some of these, uh, nutrients that are necessary for bone health. And it, you know, you're not going to get that in a calcium and vitamin D combined supplement pill, right? You just need to make sure that you're eating a, a wide variety of things. That's very good because I think sometimes people are going vegan but they're not necessarily doing whole food plant-based. And then when you get into these things that are in crinkly packages, you're not necessarily eating things that are high in all these minerals and these nutrients. So sticking yeah. to the basics there, and if you're just eating things that grow from the ground or you can pull off of a tree and you eat enough variety and eating the rainbow, that makes it simple, doesn't it? Just think about that when you're eating. Yeah, absolutely. So right about that. And, and you know, this is the, a little bit of the reason of why, um, you know, our, um, the, the, where we're working, uh, Jeff and I, the plant-based telehealth.com, it is so important to have a physician that knows a little bit more about, you know, what is it that is plant-based and what am I, what is it that I can do to try to help myself into the osteoporosis. So we kind of help your physician primary care. We assist them to be able to continue in the right direction. So I think on that, it is so important, so. Yeah, this is a very good topic that we're bringing up because I think this is a topic that perhaps people that have their uh, doctors that they see in person, and, and some people are even afraid to tell their doctors that they're on this lifestyle because they the doctors don't know about it and may question it. and and they're worried about what their doctors might say. So it's really hard to get that kind of direction and knowing that they have access to physicians like you on plantpacetelehealth.com, uh, that they can just be open and say, you know what, I eat, all <laughs> I don't eat animal products and I eat all these plants and, and these are my concerns and they don't have to worry about having any kind of lecture from somebody that isn't familiar with this, but that only learned about things in medical school and didn't have the further education that you guys have had. I think that we have a question from the audience. So let's put that up. So Gina, hi, Gina. She wants to know, she said, I might have missed it, but is it possible to improve osteoporosis or osteopenia as opposed to slowing the progression? So Dr. Pierce, maybe you want to tell everybody the difference between the two and then we can ask tell Gina what your answer is. Sure. So I think, um, so I think it's possible. I think the, the main focus that we have is for prevention because you're doing a little bit every day from when you were a kid or an adolescent. And that little bit every day really uh, just adds up over the years and the decades to help um, slow pro progression to, to prevent it, right? There are people who go to their grave without a, a uh, DEXA scan T score of worse than minus 2.5. These are, we'll talk, we can talk about the way to diagnose it a little bit. Um, so there, there are definitely ways to prevent it. Uh, question about, um, well, once you've been given this diagnosis um, that you have a, you know, super frail bones based on the x-ray test, um, can you, you know, turn it around and have bones like a 30 year old um, if you work really hard for the next week and a half? Well, you know, um, probably, probably not. There are a couple of things that I think that are subtle in that. So one is um, there is a certain amount, and I just learned this recently, there's a certain amount of intertest error between the, the uh, DEXA scan, which is the, the x-ray scan to diagnosis, um, to where you can do, you know, you could do a scan today and a scan tomorrow and a scan the next day on the same person and, and have three different readings because there's a small amount of error. And this is true for lab tests in general mm -hmm. and uh, apparently true for this Texas scan. So you could, um, and it can be a, a fairly significant change that's just considered part of the, of the test error that's inherent to it. And so we have to be a little bit careful to say, well, man, I got my DEXA scan two years ago and I've done these things and now it's, you know, uh, 
one and a half point worse or one and a half point better, um, it's hard to say um, if that's just the intertest um, inborn error or if it's something based on what you've done. Um, it, there are also, mixed into that, there are also cases that seem very clear um, that they have reversed their osteoporosis um, and it's not just that error. And so uh, I think it's Ruth Heydrich, who's a great example. And this is, you know, this is a case example. This is not something that we weigh major decisions on, but um, she had metastatic breast cancer in her forties and, uh, and osteoporosis associated with it. And she decided to like really work on uh, her, um, her physical activity and on her diet. And she, you know, has run something like 67 marathons or something like that um, in her life. Now she's in her 60s, her, um, you know, and her osteoporosis uh, went away. Um, and, um, and so I think, I think we, we should focus on prevention. I think that even if you have a diagnosis of osteoporosis, you shouldn't throw up your hands and say, well, gosh, now I have to take one of these $2,000 a month uh, injection medications. And that's the only thing that's going to save me. Um, uh, that you just double down on what you're doing, talk with a doctor who's knowledgeable about these things, double down on your weight training um, stuff, uh, on having a good diet, and then also avoiding the what we sometimes call bone thieves or different uh, practices or substances mm -hmm. that you might be using that are going to be weakening your bones, uh, smoking cigarettes, drinking excessive alcohol, um, taking corticosteroids um, and other medications and things like that. Excellent. We actually interviewed Dr. Ruth Heydrich, and we'll put a link to that. Mm. And she, she's a she's a light, and she's very very motivational. So it's going to be a great thing to watch if you haven't gotten to join us. So Dr. Fontaine, what do you want to say about that to that answer that question? Um, so a good thing about what uh, Jeff said also it depends where the 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 test is done. Um, you know, our, the the typical then this the the gold standard is to do a DEXA of your uh, that's the name of the text and on the um, spine or the uh, hip. Um, however, we do have a lot of tests that are done into the ankle and different bones that may not be um, representing as good as the typical DEXA, so gotta be careful. Uh, and, and it's all numbers, so osteoporosis, the standard deviation is minus 2.5, and osteopenia is a little less than that. That means you're not as bad as the osteoporosis. So I think it's some sort of an evolution into what happened in your bones. Um, and again, I think to answer the question is that, uh, yes, I think that there's definite possibility to... Uh, improve your bone, uh, making sure that you, again, have a chance to discuss with somebody that knows about it, a physician that knows more about it, and to um, help you and assist you into having, you know, a program for your exercise. I've done exercise physiology before I did medicine, so I have a pretty good idea of what about exercise and then into the diet. I've done, you know, lifestyle and plant-based. So, and, you know, being able to adjust and see what are you taking for medication? What is it that you're doing for movement? What is it that we can do? If you decide that, you know, you really don't want to take medication. So when you think about it also is that if you decide to accept to do a test, if they tell me that I have osteoporosis, what is it that I'm ready to do about it? You know, that's usually one of the biggest things. doesn't mean that because you have a test and we tell you you have osteoporosis, you have to think about what am I going to do? Because we all think like, oh my gosh, they're going to tell me everything is good. But no, sometimes we tell you it's not good. And so what are you ready to do? So and that's the big factor too. Right. And it, it's really, it's it's not too late though, right? I mean, we talked about prevention, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, that not everybody's in their, you know, 20s and 30s. So some people are either diagnosed with it or they're concerned about it. So what do you think about that, Dr. Fierce? Is it ever too late to do something? It's, it's not. Uh, it's not too late. I mean, I think, remember what the traditional medical model that I, that Elizabeth and I were trained in was um, uh, we don't pay too much attention to prevention. And then when you get the diagnosis, oh, then we jump in with the medication. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, if someone was, you know, contacts uh, us uh, tomorrow and says, you know, I'm 70, um, I've, uh, I haven't paid attention to my diet or my exercise all my life. I just got this bone scan. It shows that I have osteoporosis. You know, what can I do? 
well, this is great that you're talking to us right now, right? Because we can instill all these uh, recommendations that we're talking about today for prevention. It's the same recommendations that we're gonna say for um, trying to uh, stabilize it or, or make your bone mass better. I mean, um, this is, um, you know, I want to be clear that the that the typical uh, recommended approach, if you have a diagnosis of osteoporosis, either based on the standard deviation, what they call the T-score being worse than 2.5 or worse, or having a fragility fracture, like one of those um, hip uh, vertebra, wrist, or shoulder uh, fractures that we talked about, um, is is to start a is to start a medication. The most common one is alendronate, known as Fosamax, and um, at the the best compilation of studies uh, via Cochrane Review, which is a very respectable way to look at the data, um, it, they showed that there was about a 1% decrease in fracture risk. And so um, uh, there's a great website for people who like, who want to understand the literature better called dnnt.com. And NNT stands for number needed to treat, number of people who need to be treated with a medication to see a benefit and how that balance begins the harms. And if you look at putting 100 uh, people who have a diagnosis of osteoporosis on a medication for three years, which is the average uh, study time for these, um, uh, for these clinical studies, three to five years, if you put them 100 uh, people on uh, the pill, then 94 of those people aren't helped. They didn't get a fracture, but maybe they weren't going to get a fracture anyway. About five out of 100 avoid a vertebral fracture. Um, which can be good if it was going to be a painful vertebral fracture or not all that important if it was going to be one of those silent uh, vertebral fractures. And about one out of 100 avoided a hip fracture. And so if that 1%, that one out of 100 is worth it for you to take a medicine where you, you know, which has some risk of side effects, esophageal problems, you need to take it on empty stomach, stay sitting up for 30 to 60 minutes, don't, drink, don't eat or drink anything else besides water during that time. Um, if all of that is worth it for you um, to avoid that in the chance that you're that one person out of 100 where you avoid a hip fracture, then do it. And that's great. But don't just take the pill and think that that's going to fix everything. The, uh, you know, it's, this is a great example of how American medicine, modern medicine is great. If you're having a heart attack in the moment, they will swoop in and save your life a lot of times. But we're not great for uh, making medications that will help cure a chronic disease by and large. And these pills, um, which can help a small percentage of people, um, are another example of that. And yeah. No, that's very good to, to hear that. Um, now, Kathy C. wants to know, and I know that you're not necessarily going to give out a diagnosis without getting some of these medical history, but maybe part of the question, do you go by the T-score or the Z-score? If my worst Z-score is negative 1.0, and if you suggest a prescription drug, which one would you recommend? So Dr. Pierce, you want to address that one? <laughs> So it's interesting. So uh, a T-score is how your bone mineral density compares to the average 30-year-old, uh, which can be, you know, which can always be depressing because you're comparing it to uh, people who have the at the peak of their bone density. And that's what I see the recommendations based on uh, for starting medications, for how soon should you get another uh, DEXA scan, um, and uh, things like that. I, uh, the Z-score is a comparison of your bone min mineral density to other age-matched age controls. So if you're seven, 65, getting your recommended first DEXA scan as a woman, your Z-score is compared to other 65-year-old women. Um, I don't see that used as a major recommending point uh, for when to start meds. And so um, if a patient came to me and says, hey, here are my DEXA scan results, should I start a medication or do I need to do more with my lifestyle measures, um, I would just be talking to them based off of, uh, if we're going to use numbers, just to be based off their T-score. I don't know, uh, Elizabeth, if you use the Z-score for anything. No, I agree. T-score and, um, and, you know, again, here, here we are in a society that, um, you know, prefers say, okay, so I, I have this number. Uh, why don't you just treat me? So we prefer to be treated as opposed to go with those lifestyle uh, changes, which include the prevention. So it, it's, um, it, it's something that we want to work at Plant-Based Health. We want to have a protocol to try to assist 
help people that have osteoporosis in order to help them to reverse uh, and improve their bone mass. So especially if you have a minus one, um, I definitely would have a tendency to say, hey, this is the time. This is the time to do prevention as opposed to use those uh, treatment, which as like uh, Jeff mentioned, have side effects and are extremely expensive. So, you know, I'm not against it. And I know that Jeff is probably like me, um, but uh, we need to be careful and um, we need to uh, explore other um, possibility to try to help the population to understand that there's other ways to improve their bone mass. Okay. And uh, Dr. Fontaine, Kathy also wants to know, how do you treat osteoporosis naturally without going on Fosamax? Oh, so her doctor wants her to go on Fosamax. But I guess she's saying, I cannot do high impact exercises because of hip and back issues. And, and there again, I guess, you know, especially as we're aging, if we haven't been active, this can present a problem. So what do you think, Dr. Fontaine? Well, I think uh, very important, Kathy, to be able to explore, you know, your whole health. There, there might be other reason, um, obviously, for you to be at higher risk or are you taking any other medication? What is the type of um, diet that you have presently? Um, measuring your vitamin D is another good example uh, and see what you're eating. We have a tendency to uh, do an evaluation, a journal of what you eat in order to see, oh, are you eating sufficient calcium? Are you, um, you know, having enough vitamin D? What is it that you're eating? And then explore what are the exercises that you can do. Obviously, you got to be careful. You do obviously have some injuries that makes it that it's not possible for you to do some typical exercise, but you might be able to do some other exercise that allow you to carry the weight, like doing biceps or other things. Uh, that will uh, be okay for you to do. So we need to be able to to talk to you, to see who you are and evaluate you uh, before I would just say, okay, definitely don't do Fosamax. I wouldn't do that. I have to know exactly who you are and see if there's any other things that we can do before we would say um, remove the medication or can we do other things? So, you know, what do you think, Jeff? Yeah, totally agree with all that, Elizabeth. Um, I when I was looking up exercise, um, uh, different exercise routines, recommendations, programs, um, uh, it's good to uh, assess how stable uh, you are and what you can do with where you at, where you are at right now. So um, you know uh, there are you know there's the world's strongest men competition where you're walking around carrying tree trunks on your shoulders well those that's probably pretty good for osteoporosis but not if you're you know you weigh 90 pounds and are 80 years old um and so there are uh there are national osteoporosis foundation i think the nih like uh, and working with a smart uh, physical therapist physical uh, exercise trainer to say hey look this is what this is where i am right now physically this is what i can do um what can i do um exercise wise that will help me with osteoporosis and so um so there's certainly the balance stuff that elizabeth was talking about earlier via tai chi yoga and things like that but there's also things like well instead of going for a trail run um you run on a you go for a walk on an elliptical machine um and that is much uh um less stressful for your jo joints you're less likely to fall over and break your hip while trying to reduce your risk for osteoporosis um, uh, so you just, you do it in a safe and smart way. You start slow, uh, and you build up from there. And so, you know, without, uh, being able to answer your question specifically, um, uh, but just giving general advice that there are exercise programs for people who do want to start exercising at age 65. Um, and it's, uh, you know, being careful that you're not going to overdo it from a cardiac standpoint and that you're also not overdoing it from a, um, risk, uh, to your joints and your body in general. Yeah, that's good information because oftentimes when we get a diagnosis or or that we're just making a change to our lifestyle and we say, oh, I'm going to go out and exercise. And then we just mm -hmm. do a little bit too much for somebody that's been sedentary too long. So and Dr. Fontaine is is nodding her head because you are uh, very familiar with this. So you want to give any words of caution or advice as far as what kinds of exercises people should think about doing? Mm, well, thinking about what we just said, uh, I think it was Kathy that was asking the question. Is that you know, not nothing wrong regarding the physician, but you know, we we tend to go very uh, quickly. Um, we do the evaluation and we do the treatment. 
um, not thinking about the whole uh, individual and taking the chance to, like I said earlier, to evaluate what are the different elements. So obviously, I agree with Jeffrey that it's nice to have somebody involved, like uh, you know, physical therapy or a chiropractic. You know, for some people that could be very useful. Uh, but I, I, because of my uh, past into exercise physiology, I take time to see what is it that they're able to do that we can increase. And, and you know what, Amy, the physician, the people listen to their physician. So if we just take time to encourage them to do some prevention, so take time to evaluate, like I said earlier, what is it that they're eating? I can take time to evaluate what is it that their problem is and be doing like a prescription of exercise and maybe having them assist by a physical therapist or a health coach that will be able to assist them with the exercise. So I'm there to hopefully look at the whole individual in order. And that's what we do at Plan B. Still, I'm hoping to be, uh, you know, assist the individual or the entire health in order to say, hey, what would be the best for you? Right. And that's so important. I mean, the traditional doctors that we see, they just have that, you know, 10 minutes and they have to my 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 dad used to have a physician that and he called him the butterfly <laughs> because we come in <laughs> and then fly out. <laughs> and <laughs> and we really need more than that, especially when we have mm. conditions that we're very concerned about. And you know, they the doctors are doing on their model of of care, that's what sure. they're doing the best that they can to treat as many people as they have to in that short amount of time. And that's why the telehealth medicine, especially when you have a concern like this and you're ha and you're seeing a doctor and they're telling you maybe you want to go on this medication and you really don't feel good about it to get another person's opinion that there's a medical doctor that knows not just about that condition, but about lifestyle, because it's not, you can't just think, oh, I just have to take a pill or I have to take a supplement and I just have to do this one thing or make this one treatment. And then it's all just going to be, well, probably just be status quo, probably won't necessarily get better. So let's see, we have another question. And that is from Gina. Oh, thank you, Amy. A lot of us are older already and want to know what to do to improve yeah. it. Exactly. So Gina said, I think your audience is very motivated to improve it without taking pills. Well, and, and oh, Beverly, I agree with Gina. We want to improve without pills. See, this is, you're, you're speaking to the choir, but this is something that we can share with other people that may not understand that this is something that we can do. And, and, and everybody is just really enjoying what you guys are saying. And wow, this just time is flying by. Do you want to say anything in closing, uh, Dr. Fontaine, about what we can think about as far as osteoporosis? I think I mentioned that before. I'm going to say it again. Prevention, prevention, prevention. And on that, lifestyle medicine can help. PlanBasedTelehealth.com. You come and see us. We'll be more than happy to assist you. And Dr. Pierce? Yep, we, we're a nation of sitters. We sit for breakfast for our commute. We sit in front of a computer at work and we sit watching TV uh, while we sit and eat dinner. And we, we gotta do everything that you can to uh, reverse that, getting outside, um, being active, um, eating uh, a well-balanced diet, avoiding things like cigarettes and excessive alcohol. Um, and you excessive salt and these other um, components that can contribute to it and you can reverse and treat your osteoporosis. Now, isn't it wonderful that we can adopt a lifestyle? And of course, we don't call it a diet because it's not just a diet. Eating plant-based, that's just one part of many components of a healthy lifestyle. But isn't it wonderful that we can eat plant-based and all these other things that we're talking about as far as exercise and of course, sleep and stress management. These doctors know about all of these things and how they are all a component about good health. And so, but it's so great that we can do these things that they're talking about, and they're not just going to help us prevent or or help treat osteoporosis. But there's just so many other types of diseases that we would have to be concerned about preventing or treating, and all of these things will help those things as well. So it's just a win-win-win. And I just want to thank Dr. Pierce and Dr. Fontaine 
for taking the time today to spend with us and to talk about this really important topic. I know a lot of people have concerns. And of course, you can't diagnose without meeting somebody. And people can meet you, one of you or both of you at plantbasedtelehealth.com. And they can give you their medical background and they can email you things and share things. And you guys can, I mean, Dr. Fontaine, what can you do? Because you're, if you're not meeting somebody in person, but you're meeting them kind of like what we are doing, telehealth, what can you do without being able to meet them in person? You can still help them, right? Oh, absolutely. I've always said to where I was working before the importance of being able to use uh, telehealth, telemedicine. Uh, you know, we can do so many, uh, we can um, have the chance to review what's going on with people. We take time to, you know, listen. That's probably one of the most important things that we don't do in medicine. Listen to the people and being able to assist them. I'd like to add that we're not only Jeffrey and I, we're eight physicians at Plain Bay. So we're a lot of people that uh, cover all United States. Uh, and therefore, um, you know, you're always going to be able to have somebody that can help you into the world of uh, lifestyle medicine and osteoporosis. Yes, and I'm a fan of plant-based telehealth, and I've interviewed, I'm going to be interviewing all the doctors, but I've almost made it around the circles. And so that if any of you want to see what some of the other doctors, if you want to see what their personalities and, and uh, specialties are, you can check out some of my past videos. So Dr. Pierce, what do you want to say about being a plant-based telehealth doctor and how that can work? It works really well. You know, uh, another part of my profession is helping uh, women deliver their babies. And so I, I can't do that via telehealth. It has some limitations. But for doing what we're doing with lifestyle medicine, it, telehealth is a great uh, platform for that because we can have 30 or 60 minute uh, appointments as compared to the, you know, 10 to 15 minute appointment that a lot of doctors are having to use in uh, busy in-person practices. You know, we got 30 or 60 minutes. We have the time beforehand to review uh, diet summaries and really long questionnaires that give you a chance to really let us know um, uh, about your health history before we meet you for that visit. Um, and so much is, yes, listening to what's going on, making some recommendations, perhaps out of the box of what uh, you might be getting from uh, your primary doc. And, and we want to work alongside her or him uh, to uh, help you make um, good choices for your health that are going to support the work that you uh, may already be doing with your primary doctor. Right. So they, they will treat some, no matter what state you are, all 50 states. And if you have, they can order blood tests. I mean, there's all kinds of things that they can do. So I, I'm really mm -hmm. a fan if you're looking for a, another way to uh, think about a solution for what your medical care is doing for you. That's something that you really should consider. So I really want to thank you, Dr. Fontaine, Dr. Pierce, for taking time out of your busy days because you guys, are, you're not just physicians, you have active lifestyles and you do a lot of very interesting things. But now stay tuned for a special announcement. And but I did want to thank Rebecca from PKA Solves because she's been in the background. And I tell you, especially when I have more than one guest, it's really nice to have somebody in the back. Hi, Rebecca. Somebody in the background to toggle back and forth between the, the views and handle the questions. And then I could just enjoy my time with the guests. And I also want to thank Jess from Just Task Voice. She did the voiceovers and the countdown. But most of all, I want to thank you guys that are listening and watching because it's so important for us to spread the message of plant-based health and lifestyle. It's so important to share the fact that there's doctors out there because there are people that are looking, oh, I wish there was a plant-based doctor. Well, there are, there's lots of them and it's so important to share that information. And so by you liking and subscribing and sharing and viewing broadcasts like this, it's going to help tell the internet and the world that this lifestyle is something to really be looking at and can be very healing. So I wanted to tell you that Jess Has Voice is going to show us who's coming up next, but I'm going to tell you who it is. So guess what? We have Dr. Jeffrey Pierce and Dr. Elizabeth Fontaine. They're coming back on Wednesday, September 15th at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific. And they're going to talk about pregnancy, which is so excited because Dr. Pierce talked about delivering babies. So please come back and stay tuned and you'll get to see what we can talk about as far as a plant-based pregnancy and how you can make it healthy. And until I see you guys again, type it in the comments with me. Be strong, be well, and be 
Green. 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 <laughs> Bye. Bye.